Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is Episode 7, Virtual Reality and Digital Real Estate, with our guest, Trevor Caverco, a technology entrepreneur and angel investor. Please follow us on Twitter, at Liberty E Podcast, and Facebook, slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes are found on our website, www.LibertyEntrepreneurs.com, and on YouTube. Enjoy the show. With me today is Trevor Coverco, who's a technology entrepreneur and angel investor. In 2010, he founded eProf.com, which is an online education platform, which was recently acquired by Hansa International. And in 2014, Trevor founded Polymath Labs, a virtual real estate company. Polymath was acquired by 4DBS in the summer of 2015. In late 2015, Trevor launched a private equity fund that acquires and manages international digital assets, such as established cash flowing websites. Trevor is an angel investor with a portfolio covering startups in Bitcoin, telecommunications, renewable energy, and virtual reality, and also operates Bitcoin ATMs in the Toronto area. Trevor is also an advisor of Sharp Scholar, CoinKite, and BitX. Trevor, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Good to be here, Ash. I'm excited to, uh, to do the show with you. I've heard a lot of good things. Thank you. So, Trevor, tell us a bit about your first startup experience. There was kind of an important point in my life while I was a student. Um, my first life, I was actually an athlete, a professional athlete. And then um, after some injuries and, and other things, I decided to go back to school and I was a little behind, so I had to catch up with all my peers and uh, you know, carve my own way through the corporate world. So I was doing finance at kind of a stuffy uh, business school here in, in Toronto, Canada. And uh, it didn't really appeal to me. So I was kind of at a crossroads if I wanted to dive into this industry and spend the rest of my life uh, building my career or to do something else. And uh, I made a decision. I basically woke up one morning and told myself, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> Not because I'm exceptionally uh, creative or uh, competent in this industry yet or anything like that or smart or anything, but I don't care. I'm going to do it and I'm going to figure it out as I go. And most so, it, so it was just one morning you woke up and you were like, I'm, I'm not really content with where I'm at or with the schooling that I'm going to, it's not keeping my interest. I want to be an entrepreneur just like that. And not only that, no matter what, no matter how many times I fail, no matter how homeless and broke I am, I'm going to continue to do it. And I'm going to continue to wake up and, and learn and improve. And eventually I figured it would just be a matter of time before I figured it out and, and became successful. Yeah. So what characteristics would you say make a good entrepreneur? The first thing that comes to mind is is persistence, but not in the, in the traditional sense. Um, you don't have to be persistent on one specific project, but when you decide to, you know, be a self-employed person, you have to commit to that. And if you if you just kind of uh, tiptoe into it, saying, "Oh, I'm going to give it a, give it a shot," and my corporate job is going to be there waiting for me, I don't I don't think you're going to be able to have that urgency, concrete mentality that you need when you're going to uh, start something new. Yeah, so your first startup experience was with ePROF, is that right? Yes, ePROF was uh, what I decided to drop out of school to go and start. Me and a, and a friend of mine moved to China because we got into an accelerator program out there. And we didn't really know a ton about anything tech related. We didn't have a lot of connections. We didn't have a Rolodex. Um, and, and we didn't really care. And we didn't have any inhibitions in that sense which was probably our biggest strength back then. We didn't have any limiting beliefs of uh, who we knew or who we didn't know. We would just cold call up venture capitalists after being live for a, f a few weeks with no revenue customers or success stories to, to speak of. 
because we had no idea. We didn't know that there was kind of a pecking order and a hierarchy. And I think that was an asset for us because it opened a lot of doors for us to meet people that admired those types of qualities. And we applied to every, you know, incubator and accelerator program on planet Earth and got into exactly one of them. So tell the audience what EPROF is and how you got the idea for EPROF. EPROF is a lot of things. We, uh, it started out as a virtual marketplace for classes. So kind of like eBay for, for classes, which I think is still a great idea. I think other companies have done a good job executing that idea, like Udemy, for example, and others. Uh, but that was the original idea. Uh, we wanted to, to be that live kind of marketplace. We came out very aggressively anti-mainstream education, anti-university, um, all these convictions that we still believe, but that, that was kind of our, our mandate at the beginning was to have a very cost-effective and superior form of education that was not connected to the mainstream education system at all. Right, and this was back around 2010, correct? Yeah, 09, 2010. Okay, so this was, you saw this as competition for the brick and mortar type of colleges or maybe even high school, but it's EPROF like professor, correct? Correct, and we, we got the domain, which was a, a first small victory for us. It's a five letter domain that's kind of catchy and easy to pronounce. We got it by cold calling the owner of the domain I, wow. I forget how we got this guy's email but uh, he was an entrepreneur his name is Ali Devar he, he uh, eventually founded a company called Zeit that was acquired by uh, Flipboard I think a lot of your listeners would know the, the iPad app there so he's like an accomplished entrepreneur and he kind of knew the struggle and knew the capital constraints of, of early stage startups so he rented us the domain at a dollar per year and attached an option at the end for us to buy it off him in three years for fifty thousand dollars. Wow. So that was absolute, you know, hef- that's wonderful. You know, no cost up front, no risk, no nothing. And it's just because we asked. It's just because we had a list of names we wanted and we thought that was going to be an important uh, part of, of the business and and that was kind of a, a small victory for us to get the, the wheel spinning a little bit. Yeah, I, I've been emailing the guy that owns libertye.com for I don't know how long since nobody knows how to spell entrepreneur. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, I haven't heard back yet, but I'll, I'll keep being persistent. Tell us a story about EPROF. What did you learn from EPROF or what failure do you remember? Just generally, we made pretty much every mistake in the book. I, I think even back then, the self-coaching and entrepreneurship education industry wasn't really as developed as it is now and it's there's so much widespread amazing content out there and blogs and podcasts and you know investors and other entrepreneurs in your area that we could have sidestepped a lot of the hard learning that we did if we just you know learned the lean frameworks necessary to start uh, a startup and we didn't really know any of those at the time so we had to learn things the hard way and we did every pretty much every mistake in the book, like making our investors and everybody else sign NDAs if they wanted us to talk about our idea. We were fighting over equity in the early days and you know, we, were, we thought our business and, and our idea was actually worth something when in reality it wasn't. And the list just goes on and on of, of we recruited people in the wrong way, we didn't really build a prototype or a minimum viable product as as quickly as we should have. It took us a long time to kind of figure out the proper way to do things and and it really showed when we did learn how to do it that things were were way easier. So what let's 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 carry this into your next startup adventure, Polymath Labs. Tell us a little bit about that and what lessons you learned from Eprof that you were able to implement and not repeat those mistakes with Polymath Labs. <clears throat> So Polymath Labs was a virtual reality real estate company. And what we did is we built software on top of the Oculus Rift, which is a VR headset that Facebook now controls. And it's basically, if you haven't worn one of these things, you put it on and it's like you're entering the matrix. 
because all your sensory um, outputs are fooled into thinking what you're viewing is actually real life. Even though you can still kind of tell it's it's a video game because the the quality is not you know real life yet. So yeah, I, I tried this thing on at a conference, and I knew right away I wanted to be involved in this industry. I remember when the iPhone came out, and I was considering you know getting involved early, and I didn't, and I kind of always regretted that I missed the boat uh, in the early stages of the iPhone. So I didn't want to make the same mistake with virtual reality. So I started this company that I was the, the sole founder of called Polymath Labs, and uh, what we did is take floor plans of pre-construction condos in Toronto, and then we implemented them into a VR framework so you could actually walk around the floor plans of a condo that's not constructed yet. And the idea was to sell this to property developers who would then use it as a sales tool to help get pre-construction sales, which is how the, the market is predicated on. Basically, <clears throat> in big cities like Toronto and New York and LA, if you're a developer and you're building these buildings and you can't sell three quarters of the building, you can't even start construction. So right. the whole business is predicated on, on making sure you can sell air. And then I thought if we could add this technology of this visceral immersive experience of walking around a digital space remotely uh, when it's not built yet, then we'd be able to do well. It's very interesting because I remember you demoing this for me maybe six or eight months ago. And these were pre-construction places that I'm in Panama and I would have no idea what this place is really going to look like. But through your VR type of implementation, I could dive right in and I could walk around and see the kitchen and change the, change the carpet or change the cabinets or I could go into the master bedroom or see what my view is going to look like once construction is done. It's, it's really neat. So how did it differ with EPROF versus Polymath Labs on approaching venture capitalists or investors to try to get this off the ground? Yeah, I, I was really proud. You know, we didn't exit EPROF. We didn't sell EPROF for three and a half years. Whereas for what we exited for, we probably could have mustered that up in six months or a year if we you know, knew what we know now back then. So I kind of took all, all the learning and all the mistakes I made with my first company, like I mentioned before, you know, not getting product market fit fast enough, not iterating quick enough, not listening to customers, and applied those, those lessons directly to Polymath. So what I did with, with this company was no co-founders, not that that's necessarily a bad thing to have them. I just wanted to keep things super simple, super lean. I wasn't even talking to investors. I didn't even incorporate, and, and there's, a, there's a funny story behind that I can tell you at the end. Uh, but it was very, you know, I didn't even pay people, the technical people I needed to help me. I just posted it on, on forums and boards and said, hey, who wants to help me build something cool in this really cool virtual reality space? And there were so many people in my city who were kind of uh, geek, geeky VR guys who loved doing this stuff mm -hmm. for free anyways, that I had guys, you know, help me build this for free, no money, no equity. It was just me kind of selling this kind of cool project for them. And I just took the product and kept them involved, ran with it. I promised them if I ever sold the company, I would make sure they were compensated for it fairly. So there was kind of a level of trust there. We didn't waste any time with option agreements, stock options, or employment agreements, or salaries. Super, super lean, super simple. And that just allowed us to scale a lot faster than we otherwise could have. We had our first customer right out of the gate before the product was, re was ready. We didn't wait to, to make sure everything was perfect because that way we got really good feedback from the customer on what we needed to improve on, on what we were doing well. And it was just an experience I was a lot more proud of because of, of how much we learn and, and the processes, processes we, we use that were a lot more efficient. So are you still running Polymath Labs or have you gone on to sell it as well? Polymath Labs got acquired. We were the first exit in the Oculus Rift space in the world. Wow. Which is something that was pretty cool to say. C congratulations. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we were acquired by a company 
out of Toronto. They're a private equity company. And when I was out raising money for my company, they really liked this business and, and they made a, a conditional offer for the whole thing. So we uh, didn't really have a lot of plans to sell it because it was exciting. But at the same time, we realized it was a tough business. Uh, real estate's tough to crack into. There's a lot of you know relationship requirements to, to close the big deals. And VR as a whole is a very nascent industry. Uh, it's not quite ready for prime time yet. Facebook hasn't even released the first version of the Oculus Rift, so um, it's not quite ready for prime time. And I didn't want to be the guy that had to evangelize VR to the masses because it's not right. particularly profitable to do that. I'd rather someone else spend all the investment in, into educating people and evangelizing to them and then coming back in the industry in a year or two when the, the general population is ready for it. So Trevor, that brings us to your current project here in 2015. Can you tell us about what you're doing now? I have discovered a really cool industry that not a lot of people are aware even exists. I've been traveling around this past year to conferences and events and meetups all over the world that trade secrets on how to buy and sell profitable websites. So what I've been doing after I sold my last company was meeting people who own profitable websites, meeting people who invest in these sites, and then you know sellers and brokers who kind of make it all happen. And what I mean by website is not a traditional startup um, in the sense of a small team of you know getting into an incubator of raising investor money these are all bootstrapped lifestyle businesses so this is like a blog or a newsletter or a membership site or a content site that releases content and monetizes it through google these are the kind of businesses i i mean when i i say websites and i've been absolutely smitten by this industry because it's so different than my world. The Silicon Valley style, lose a shitload of money and raise more money and lose more money and then eventually go public is, is kind of the world that I've been living in. Um, a lot of investors actually don't want to see you monetize too early. They'd rather see you focus all your attention on just ramping up users. And I noticed after talking to, to VCs, and, and talking to my VCs in my last company who just kind of were selfish and they know f for their own selfish reasons, they don't want you to have a lifestyle business that's good for you. They don't, right. they don't want you to be successful. They want you to be a, a rock star. And even if yep. it makes sense for you personally to, to sell the company or take some money off the table, you're going to get a lot of pressure from your venture capitalists to double down and risk all or nothing because they're looking for that 20 to 100 times return not for you to have a lifestyle where you're making 200,000 a year. And that's key because a lot of people don't understand the economics of running a venture fund and now that I am an investor I kind of see it from both sides of the table but as a VC if you have a portfolio of 10 companies just by nature of how tech tech and early stage companies is eight of them are going to fail. And that's just the mathematics. That's just the reality of it is that eight out of 10 are going to go to zero or close to it. And the mm -hmm. only way for you to have a viable fund is, is to have two absolute home runs that pay for everything, to have an Uber, to have a Facebook. And I don't blame the VCs for kind of having that mindset. That's just kind of the reality of the game. And that's not necessarily conducive to your personal goals. And I know it wasn't for me. And so you feel that you have a position now where you are able to understand and respect these lifestyle businesses, ones that may not get a lot of attention in the VC world, but you're able to find the value in here. And then who, who do you sell these to? Where, where are you finding people to come in and, and see, also see the value in, in a business that say, let's say it just cash flows 80 to $100,000 a month. You know, can you walk us through that market making? Well, f well, first let me say, Ash, like this stuff, I know it's right up your alley. I know it's right up a lot of, you know, young millennial wannabe entrepreneurs alley because I I've met these people who travel the world, who work from their laptop and who invest in these companies or start these companies 
or websites that just earn the money. And mm -hmm. they build these frameworks of virtual assistants and outsourcing internationally to India and, and Ukraine and Croatia, where all of the manual operations of the company is offloaded from their responsibility to somebody else. And because these companies are so profitable, you can afford to pay people to do a lot of the legwork. So I'm meeting these guys who are pulling in 150,000 US a month on autopilot, where like mm -hmm. literally every component of running the business is outsourced. They have a portfolio of five to 10 to 20 websites, some of them two to three really good profitable ones. And that's what they do. They they travel, they look for more deals, they live abroad. It's just a really compelling lifestyle. And as soon as I got a taste of that, it's something that I wanted to get involved in kind of in a different way, as I'll explain in a minute. But that's that's kind of what got me excited about this opportunity. So basically, you're building and helping people build portfolios of digital nomads. And, and you know, the traveling thing is just is just one version of how you how you could do it. I'm probably not that guy. I like having a home base and I want to do it up more of an industrial scale than just me, you know, running my own little empire personally. Um, to answer your earlier question though, what what typically happens, the dynamic of, of this industry is that you have sole proprietors. So an old guy who runs a, a blog with his wife I just I just met with a couple that sells water trampolines on the internet for cottagers. So these are just, you know, mom and pa businesses that are run online that are usually completely remote so they don't have an office, they don't necessarily have a lot of employees who are salaried, it's all contracted out. Um, and these are the type of people that you deal with and the internet revolution has created so many opportunities for people to not have an office, for people to not work a nine to five job, for people to kind of write their own tickets and build their own kind of Tim Ferriss lifestyle that you see in the four hour work week. And because of this, step two is to kind of have an investment layer on top of that and having liquidity and having marketplaces where you can actually sell a business that you started like a lifestyle business or buy one from somebody else that you want. And you really just have to know where to look. You have to know which brokers to speak to. So just kind of like in real estate, you have an agent who helps broker the buyer and the seller of a property. And it's no different with websites. You have individuals and companies that have listings of websites for sale. They have the multiple earnings uh, number that they're selling for. And it's absolutely shocking how cheap and uh, affordable a lot of these websites are. Can you give us an example of like what one of these ratios would be compared to something on say the S&P? Well, I'll, I'll start off by saying these multiples are so good they don't even calculate them on an annual basis. <laughs> they do it on a monthly basis because it wow. happens so quickly. So when I, when I first got into this and I read uh, an article from uh, David or no, it's from uh, Joe Magnotti. He's from Empire Flippers. I can give you some, some of this uh, info for the show notes. But yeah, uh, he wrote an article saying, yeah, in this industry, it's great. We love it. And, and we get about 20 times uh, PE ratios on, on the businesses that we buy and sell. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's a, approximately the same as the stock market. And then I looked a little deeper into it. And when he said 20, he meant months. No. months is the app. Right. So you're buying wow. companies with an under 2x annual earnings multiple and yeah by contrast the S&P 500 right now is trading at a 20 times earnings multiple so it's absolutely night and day. So have you experienced any failures in this new venture or has it has it all been gravy so far? Well this is kind of my my take on this, and I don't want to go too too deep into it just because it, it's outside of the scope of the conversation a little bit, uh, but what I want to do is take you know the buying and the buying especially of of websites for individuals and do it at a higher scale and by, and by that I mean I want to 
selectively acquire cash flowing web assets at really attractive valuations. And then I want to scale them up in a portfolio by leveraging, you know, synergies between two sites. So you can sell, you know, if you have one site for travelers, you can cross sell them to airlines. If you have another site that works with them um, and kind of leverage the synergies there. Um, I also want to set up an in, in-house infrastructure of marketing and due diligence people who can go find deals and do due diligence on them and software engineers who can help, you know, build the product, uh, product landscape out and the point of, of kind of doing this at scale is I can maximize the cash flow by holding on to these companies and return the, the dividends to the shareholders in the form of a dividend so it's kind of like a private equity fund that goes out and buys companies and improves them and then eventually sells the companies or just returns the, the earnings back to dividends so I want to do what these individuals are doing for themselves, but just on a, on a much larger scale. And I need to put my own money in and raise other uh, investment from other people as well. Yeah, and you're also an active angel investor. Can you compare and contrast that with what you're doing in the, the digital asset realm? Do not be an angel investor. <laughs> and, and- All right, listeners, you, you heard it here. <laughs> and, and not honestly, the, my investments, as far as I know, are doing great. Um, I invested in a Bitcoin company uh, called Shapeshift, and and Eric's like an awesome entrepreneur. If anything, I wish I invested more money in, in that company. But for the vast majority of people, angel investing is just not an intelligent thing to do because you're probably going to lose money. And not only that, you're going to lose time and unless you're having a lot of fun kind of doing it and bragging about it, I would encourage especially young entrepreneurs to take that capital, to take that energy and invest in yourself. Invest in your own businesses, invest in education to, to learn how to uh, build a company on your own. That's not to say you know you can't be the next Tim Ferriss or Chris Saka or Peter Thiel or one of these guys that's returned a thousand X for themselves and their shareholders. But I think it just makes a lot more sense to to take a step back and worry about investing your own money in, in something that's going to return you money. That's the reason I like these web startups so much is that every single business that's for sale is making money. And I don't just mean revenue. I mean after all your expenses, all your hosting costs, all your employee uh, contracting salaries and whatnot, they're all making money. And you can actually count on it. You know, It's risky because these are web businesses that – uh, are small and there's a lot of scams out there and you want to make sure you know what you're doing but to me it just makes a lot more sense to take that the capital that you have and start a company or invest in a company that's already profitable it takes a lot of, a lot of the risk off the table sure because if you don't know what it takes to start a company and to create a company and to run a company you're not going to be a very good angel investor to begin with exactly exactly so Trevor, let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin. I know you mentioned Shapeshift and Eric Voorhees, which is a, a mutual friend of ours. I've had the pleasure of meeting him in Panama. Tell us about your experience with Bitcoin or with Shapeshift, or I think you even operate a couple of Bitcoin ATMs in the Toronto area. I am the type of guy who is attracted to shiny new things. <laughs> so when Bitcoin came out, that was, I'm sure I had a similar situation to you. It was just kind of the convergence of everything I'm passionate about into one one thing. So that was kind of the end of it for me. I was always going to be an ardent supporter and evangelist of Bitcoin. Uh, so I've, I've parlayed that into some angel investing. I, I own and operate some ATMs in Toronto, uh, which is kind of a fun little side business where we take a commission on people buying and selling Bitcoins. Um, another little life tip I'll say is try to avoid hardware when possible, <laughs> unless you like things breaking down and people complaining and shipping costs. and becoming outdated. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. It's, uh, from going from never building or selling anything physical in my life to owning an ATM <laughs> was a bit of an adjustment, but, uh, just go, to go back to the, the websites again, like these are digital assets. There is no physical product. There's no office location. There's nothing chaining you down. 
there's no employee salaries and ridiculous remittance fees you have to pay to the government and payroll taxes and everything. It's all very lightweight. It's all very efficient and it's so much more enjoyable to run something without 300 you know, logistical things on your to-do list every day. And the things that you do have to do, guess what? You can go outsource that to a virtual assistant in Taiwan who's better than you at, at running you know, logistical things than you are. Now that you, know, you control your time, you're an entrepreneur, comparing that back from when you were in school or maybe an employee, what's changed and how has that provided more freedom in your life? Well, let me just say that there's this false uh, narrative out there, I think, where an entrepreneur is somehow uh, more valuable than an employee and that everybody should kind of strive to be an entrepreneur. I think there's too many entrepreneurs. I don't think we need everybody to be one because entrepreneurs need support and they need to hire people who can execute on on the little things every day. Uh, so, you know, I'm not out here beating the drum telling everybody to do what I did, drop out of school, take gigantic risks and and swing for the fences. Um, and I, I think there's nothing wrong with joining a startup, either full time or as a learning experience to eventually start your own business. I would probably do that if I could start all over again. I would have dropped out of school at the same time, but I probably would have joined a startup myself with a competent CEO who's exited before and knows what he's doing, and then just kind of emulating what he's done. And that, that would have saved me a lot of trouble. So um, the, the, the other thing is that being an entrepreneur requires a lot of the same things that being an employee requires. And you don't hear this a lot, but I've gone from you know wearing flip-flops and hoodies to the office to like, requiring everyone on my team to dress up and having that kind of mindset of this is a serious business. We have routines, we have deadlines. And I know personally, I need those, those routines and accountability in my life. I work from home now. I don't have any uh, full-time employees now. And I don't think a lot of people are cut out to be able to work from home and not be distracted. I know I struggled with it for a long time. And I think it's very important to build routines, getting up at the same time, just because you don't have a, like people think now that you're an entrepreneur, you know, you don't, you don't have to report to anybody. You don't have to wake up at the same time every day. You don't have to show up to the office. You get to wear sweatpants all day. And I, I found that's just not the case. You have to have kind of a employee mindset, not, not in the sense that you're just following orders all day, but just in the sense that. You have stuff to get done. You have deadlines. It's just that this time they're, they're self-imposed. They're not um, put on you by somebody else. Yeah, what's one habit or routine that you still have that, you, that makes you more productive? I wake up every morning. I would say at the same time, but that would be a lie. That's still something I struggle with. Um, I think, yeah, we all do. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how normal people or normies as I call them normies can do that every day but I get my workout in in the morning uh, just to get the day going that's something that kind of drives the rest of the day I say my daily affirmations every morning which are just reassuring statements you kind of say out loud like a weirdo um, when no one's around just to have that positive thinking ingrained in your day to start and I find that found that really helps you with overcoming your limiting beliefs, things that you subconsciously don't think you can do, so your body just doesn't allow you to do it. Um, you know, learning technical things was something I had a limiting belief about, and I just kind of always avoided doing it. And, and ever since I started thinking positive in the morning and reassuring myself that I can learn anything and I'm as smart as anybody else, um, I've had a lot more uh, urgency to go and learn this stuff myself so I could hold other people accountable that I was hiring to do the same thing. Yeah, that's great advice. I know, I can't remember who wrote the book um, about creating habits and, you know, men are creatures of habit. And if, if you don't have a habit, it makes it very difficult for you to depend on even yourself to get certain things accomplished or to get regularity in, into your day. And not just um, that, what, not just that, Ash, but I don't know, I, I read this study about, uh, your mind only has so much 
decision making power in it throughout the day. And every time you have to even do mundane things like what you're going to wear, what uh, what time you're going to wake up at, all these little decisions add up and fatigue you mentally throughout the day. So if you can put a lot of those decisions on autopilot or do it the night before, lay out the clothes you're going to wear, have your routines all set, have your coffee ready to brew, have all your digital stuff automated whenever possible, it takes a lot of the burden off of your mind on on not things that are priorities for you. And then it, it frees you up to really focus on the important things that you're triaging throughout the day. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I even will fill up my my hot water kettle and I have a, a liter bottle that I fill up with water. So right when I get into the office, AKA just my house in the morning, I have cold water and I have hot water ready for tea every single morning. It's something that I know I don't have to do in the morning. I can come and depend on that and, and get going. Love it. And, and even things like getting little wins early on in the day sets you off to an awesome trajectory that you can continue throughout the day. Making your bed. Uh, yeah, hey, I, my, yeah, that, I mean, I've read that over and over and over. Making your bed. It's a one minute habit that you accomplish something as soon as you get up in the morning and it gives you that sense of accomplishment. I love it. Little things like that. I have, you know, even I'm looking at my digital calendar right now and I have, it's just absolutely filled. Pretty much every block of time is a routine, something I'm supposed to check up on, you know, something that I don't have to keep in my mind. I just throw it on my calendar, throw it on my to-do list. All my routines are set out there. They all remind me at the exact time I want it to. My weekends are, are usually pretty busy because I'm reviewing the past week that I had doing as much introspection of, as I can, planning the next week, getting all my s mundane stuff like cooking and cleaning done. I try to cook for the entire week on Sunday as, as much as I can just so I don't have to worry about it during the work week. And then I keep kind of my work hours and my non-work hours segregated because as soon as you start letting it filter in and you know, I even have a different account on my Mac for, for work. And I don't have Facebook and I don't have web browsing and even news stories and text messaging on that account. It keeps me focused. I know I'm liable to get distracted easily. I probably have ADD. Uh, and that's just something that I've, I've dealt with by you know erasing all the distractions in my life that I have. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, I, I even find myself, you know, I'll go on Facebook and I'll be like, Oh, but these are very like-minded friends and maybe I can find somebody to interview or maybe I can read a news story that'll give me an idea for a blog post that I can write. And you know, you play these little games with yourself, but effectively for the most part, it's just procrastination. Another thing I find it, that helps is having one kind of account or one window open of what your task is and then bl blanking everything out, but also having one general task that you're working on and that's it. Your to-do list for today should be one item long. What's the main thing you're trying to accomplish? Are you trying to, to launch something, write something? What's the number one priority that everything else is secondary to? And then once you have that written down, staring at you all day, you know exactly what the success of the day is predicated on, either achieving that task or not achieving that task. And as soon as you don't have that hyper-focus, you start... You know, I'm, I'm very susceptible to this. I have all these different business ideas and concurrent businesses I'm working on and companies I'm supposed to be looking at and side projects. But deep down, I know those things aren't priorities for me and they don't bring my, me to my goal faster than if I just don't do that and only focus on the number one thing first and make sure that gets done, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's similar to in episode one when Stephen McCaskill said, you know, one piece of advice he was giving entrepreneurs was don't multitask, you know, have one totally. task you're going to work on and get that done. And when you're done, move on to the next task. There's a really neat Chrome plugin called Momentum. I'll put it down in the show notes. Yeah, I use that where, for, for a new tab, right? Yeah, it's for a new tab. You create a new tab. You have a, a, a beautiful image of, you know, Hawaii or something that comes up, but it says, you know, what's your one main focus today? And you put that main focus in and every time you open up a new tab, like say that you are going to slip and go to Facebook for some reason, where you open a new tab, all of a sudden the momentum tab comes up and it shows right there in big letters. This is your focus today. And I found that to be very helpful for me. 
to you know prevent me or or disencourage me from going and doing checking the Bitcoin price or you know, Google Finance or something like that. Speaking of tools, Trevor, um, can you share a tool or a shortcut or a hack that's helped you succeed? In business, you learn how to implement standard operating procedures. Have you heard of these before? I hadn't until like a couple weeks ago, <laughs> but, but uh, it's cool because it's kind of like when you're buying a, a company, you're buying their operating procedures. It's stuff that they've learned the hard way, grinding along for years and years, how to efficiently operate the business. That's what you're buying. You're buying their SOPs. These are, right. these are things like how to, how to recruit new employees, the specific uh, scripts that salespeople use, when people are getting onboarded into the company, what you show them on how to check your analytics, who does that, who's responsible. It's basically the, the DNA of your company that you write down are your standard operating procedures. And I go a step further by saying you should have standard operating procedures for yourself, for your life. If you were going to go train your son or your men men the kid you're mentoring or whatever, what what could you pass on to him, you know, if you were getting acquired personally to, to somebody else? And and these are things like the Gmail stuff that I use, all the other software tools and SaaS businesses I use, you know, uh, Dropbox and Wonderlist and everything else that everybody else and the specific ways I use it to keep me productive and to keep me efficient. So I think everybody should kind of think about what their personal standard operating procedures are that they do every day to keep them busy, to keep them productive and keep them happy. Yeah, and even on the smallest scale, I mean, I've even written standard operating procedures to help my co-hosts know how to update the website, post the new audio on our audio server and then blast it out on social media. I mean, or it could be, I'm gonna wake up at this time and eat breakfast and then I'm gonna go work out or, or whatever whatever little habits you wanna create. This is the transition of knowledge. You know, This is whenever you're looking to build something, you can't just keep it all in your head, which I feel like a lot of smart people know how to figure out a lot of these procedures, but they don't take the time to write them down and so they could get lost and whenever you're hiring someone else, now it's a, a knowledge problem because you have to transfer it from your head to their head instead of having it written out and say, hey, follow these instructions. Come to me if you have any problems. Absolutely. That's amazing advice because it, it speaks to the fact of why I like buying websites now. Because to me, starting a website or starting a company is silly right now because why do I want to go through all the hard work of finding out operating procedures for a new business? Somebody else has already done that hard work. Somebody else has already found product market fit. Somebody else has already figured out how to monetize their customers and, and make a sustainable business. That's hard to do. And there's a high failure rate of going through those processes. So why not just find, figure out how to raise capital? There's a lot of ways we could talk about next time on how you can buy stuff with no money and how you can joint venture with people to do it. But why not do that? Why not go buy Ash's podcast instead of starting out? It's a little trickier when the, the individual is the brand, but aside from that, buy the podcast, take all the standard operating procedures that Ash has kind of trialed and aired over the last couple of years, and now you're up and running. And it's a lot faster. It's kind of like skipping the whole product market fit in, in the lean startup methodology screw it, just buy another company that already has it. And I'm not talking about buying a startup, I mean, buy, go on flippa.com and buy a $700 AdSense website. You know, you, you could buy a $1,000 site that's earning, uh, I don't know, 100 bucks a month in, in profit for $1,000. You know, where right. else are you gonna get that kind of return? Um, but but consider, you know, I'm not saying don't, I think especially if you're starting out, you should go through the process of, of starting a company from scratch and learning the skills. But if you're like me and you're looking to change things up a little bit and, and uh, you want to get involved in being an a, a investor who can actually, you know, run companies and scale them up, I suggest uh, buying something that already exists. Yeah, that's amazing advice. Like you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. There's a lot of smart people out there that are figuring a lot of stuff out. You know what my favorite um, investor is now on that note? A guy, uh, I think it's called rocketfish.io in Germany. <laughs> and these guys 
it's like the most skeezy thing ever, but I love it. They find out businesses in America that are just kind of hits like Snapchat, kind of random things that came out of nowhere. And then they copy it and bring it to the German European. Oh, right, right. It's great. It's, it's like, why, why like risk starting a random thing? Like, go find out what works somewhere else. And I, I think this is good for the, the economy in general. You know, if, if something works, the worst thing you can do is, is squander your own time and resources on something that's not going to work. Go find a business model that exists. Go find a company already operating. You know it works. You, you're not going to realize how hard it is to, to make money as an entrepreneur until you try to do it. But I assure you, it's not easy. And if you can just skip that step and, and go straight to part two, which is maintaining, oiling, and growing uh, an already existing business, that's a lot more simple than starting it from scratch. Yeah, rarely does an entrepreneur create something entirely on their own without standing on the shoulders of previous entrepreneurs. You know, the, the market makes its moves on the margins. I, I say all the time that as an entrepreneur, all you really do, you're not really creating things. Eventually you create something that's, that's original, but all you are is a puzzle put together person. You, you have pieces yep. of a puzzle that you put together. And, that's right. and I, I'm not even talking about just like hiring people and I, I mean like the actual product itself is a puzzle. Especially in today's age, you don't really need to learn how to code if you don't want not just because you can hire someone to do it, but because everything that you need is already exists in little fragments already. There's open source libraries, there's plugins, there's APIs, there's templates. There's stuff out there that already looks amazing. If you're designing your own site, you're an idiot. There's stuff that exists for $9 on ThemeForest. That's amazing. That somebody spent 300 hours perfecting. That's a piece of the puzzle. And then there's back-end stuff you can do as well and you can do what I did and get someone who's a little smarter than you technically to work on your project for free and and that's all you're doing you're not like sitting in a lab and, and like a chemist kind of experimenting uh, well you are experimenting but not in that sense and that's what I mean when I say I'm an entrepreneur I just assemble pieces of a puzzle to make something that solves problems for other people that's right see the value in different areas and start putting those things together so that the sum is more valuable than their parts and you know a saying that i can't remember who i heard say this but they said hire your weakness if you know you're not a great programmer and it's going to take you know six months or a year for you to get up to the programming abilities that you're going to need for your project hire your weakness try to find somebody network out see who's smart see who's interested see who's passionate you know, and that that's going to save you a lot of time. And one of the main skills of an entrepreneur is being able to identify value and to network so you can bring all of that value together. And I, I'll go a step further and say the best way to find out if you're an entrepreneur is to see what's more appealing to you. Is it more appealing to be the puzzle piece in the picture? And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I In some situations, I like being the, the piece because I don't want to have the res responsibility and risk of having the whole uh, business at, at my feet. But do you want to be the piece of the puzzle or do you want to assemble the piece and uh, do you have a vision for what that sum is going to be at the end of the day? That's the best way for me to figure out. Uh, you know, I, I want to hire people. I don't want to hire entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of people say that that's a good idea. I don't think so. I just want people that are good at uh, following instructions, following standard operating procedures, that are good decision makers, and that's about it. And have a specialized talent. And, exactly, and have a specialized talent, of course. So Trevor, can you tell us about one influential book or blog or podcast? Books are a big part of my life. Uh, I force myself to read and I, and I enjoy it. I don't watch TV, so that's freed up a lot of time to, to read. Um, this is kind of a classic that you probably hear a lot of people recommend, but I'm definitely not going to stray from that. Um, I'm just pulling it up on my phone here. Uh, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. An absolute classic. It's not specifically related to business. In fact, it has more of a corporate kind of tint, tinge to it, but it's just kind of that, that positive thinking on how to be magnetic, on how to network, on how to get people to like you. Absolutely, how to win friends and influence people. Oh my gosh, I could read that book 
you should read it more than once uh, just to mm-hmm. kind of stay stay in that mindset. Uh, anything by Tim Ferriss is good. Um, you kind of either like Tim or you don't. And uh, I don't subscribe to all the stuff he talks about, but just his mindset of always learning, of kind of taking risks, traveling the world, meeting new people, uh, four-hour work week would be number two. And for number three, there's a book on copywriting. You know, there's a lot of really good sales books, but one, one skill that I think is really underrated uh, in business in general and startups specifically is copywriting and, and just how to sell using words. That's basically what copywriting is. And there's a book I read called The Copywriting Handbook by Joseph Sugarman, which is just a phenomenal uh, introduction to copywriting and, and how to convince people through print so that's all I'll say on that <clears throat> in terms of of podcasts uh, I always listen to tech that's kind of Tim Ferriss has a really good tech podcast so I'll recommend that uh, you could just type his name in in terms of the startup world I like the A16Z podcast uh, that's the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz that puts it on but they always have really you know Deep critical thinkers. You should you should always listen to VCs because they're really smart, and they're the ones putting money up, and they're kind of the gatekeepers of the industry in the startup world. And I'll say one more podcast for buying and selling websites if that's what you're interested in. Uh, the Rhodium Podcast by Chris Yates is really great, and he'll teach you how to you know get started on how to buy your first website, on how to do due diligence, on kind of the scammers to look out for. Uh, don't always just read the, the listen to the new stuff. Go back into the archives and find out, you know, episode one through ten when he kind of introduces you to the the whole system. I, I highly suggest that. <laughs> In terms of blogs, Ash, uh, I read way too many blogs. I, I have a kind of fire hose RSS reader uh, where I have my venture beats. Uh, the, the way I I don't necessarily want to recommend specific blogs because that's a very personal thing, but find out. What I do when I'm trying to learn something new is subscribe to all the top publications in that industry and then check your RSS reader multiple times a day and just consume as much content as you can. So for me, that's uh, Empire Flippers blog, Rhodium's blog, uh, all the brokers like Quiet Light and Digital Exits have their own blogs. And all the new fresh content where you can stay on top of where the industry is going just come directly to your RSS feed. Um, so that, that's what I would suggest. Whatever you want, you want to learn, subscribe to their blogs, and then just make sure you're checking them every day. And don't forget to add Liberty Entrepreneurs slash feed to your RSS feed as well. Oh, let me pull that up because uh, <laughs> I just have my newest uh, my newest member on my exclusive RSS feed. Thanks. For <laughs> All right. Bro. Um, could you give us the name of a, a very influential entrepreneur or role model in your life? Travis Kalanick is the Uber guy. He's just great. Um, <laughs> if you if you listen to some of his earlier interviews where he was a little more uh, gunslinging back then, he's not so worried about being a public company CEO when he was just kind of getting started. But he he's honestly the template of somebody who just plows ahead. I really admire the guy. Especially, I, I really like people who have a big win and they have as much money as they need for the rest of their lives, but they stay hungry and they just love creating value and love starting companies so much that they just go on and build a behemoth. Uh, Slack is another example. Uh, the guy sold Flickr 10 years ago or whatever it was and then he's like, ah, I'm bored. I'm going to go change the world and and another Again, billion dollar yeah. company, but, right. but for Kalanick, he just <laughs> to deal with all the nonsense that he, that the company has to of fighting taxi cab companies, of all these you know bleeding heart reporters who just hate the fact that you're successful, even though they probably use your product every day, mm-hmm. is just a really inspiring to me. And building a product and a service that's that's so sticky and solve so many problems that you don't even care if it breaks the rules because people love it so much that they can't ban you. Every politician right. that tries to ban Uber is writing their own death ticket because people love it and people use it every day. 
Um, I, I just love everything about that company. I use it. I spend probably a grand every month just like taking Ubers everywhere. And I'm, I'm happy to contribute to that insane valuation that they're at right now. Well, Trevor, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. It's been a very powerful episode, very interesting. Is there anything that you'd like to plug or give contact details? Uh, you could uh, you can have me on Facebook. I actually love interacting with people on Facebook. My LinkedIn kind of sucks. I have Twitter as well, uh, at Trevor Caverco is my name. But, uh, but yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Ash. I'll just say people... This, this buying and selling website industry, I think, is, is really underrated right now. It's still early, so there's, it's not too late to kind of get on the bandwagon. And if you're interested in learning more about the fund that I'm launching or just want general advice, just reach out to me. Uh, Trevor Caverco at Gmail is a good way to do it. And, uh, and thanks again, man. Thank you so much, Trevor. We'll include all of that in the show notes.